Hello, my name is Ashlyn Connolly. I will talk to you today about key correlated attacks. Uh, this is joint work with Buya Farshim, who is now at the University of York, and with Georg Fuchsbauer, who is now at TU Vienna. Uh, this was all carried out while the three of us were together at ENS and while I was doing my PhD. And for me, this was quite a whirlwind introduction to symmetric uh, provable security. So if you come with me now, I'll give you a little uh, tour of what we discovered in those days. So any first uh, foray into the playground of symmetric security was you stumbling upon uh, three algorithms, one being a generation algorithm, which outputs a key K, an encryption algorithm, which takes as input a key K, a message M, uh, encrypts the message onto the key and outputs a ciphertext, and a decryption algorithm, uh, DEC, which takes as input to key K, a uh, ciphertext C, decrypts the ciphertext under the key and outputs the message. Uh, I show you this picture now because this will form kind of the basis for many of the ideas that I try to explain later on, and uh, I'll update it to show you how things advanced over time. And so when we think about cryptography, one of our main concerns is uh, security. And a way that we try to model security is by imagining an adversary uh, interacting with our system. So uh, many of the ways that I will try to explain this security is uh, via, you know, um, showing you this adversary and how they are interacting. Um, one of the first uh, notions of security was a CPA security, whereby an adversary had access to an encryption oracle to which they could query messages and uh, from which they could obtain ciphertexts. And so um, when we want to try to see what an adversary can learn from these interactions, uh, that has different definitions. And in this work, we will work almost entirely with uh, idealized models. So our question to the adversary would be something like, um, can you distinguish whether or not this message was encrypted using a real encryption scheme or an ideal encryption scheme? So CPA was introduced already uh, in the public key setting uh, by Goldwasser and Michali in 1984, and later was uh, formalized in the symmetric setting by Bellaria et al. in 1997. And so when we define security, uh, it's nice to take a moment of reflection to say, is this good? Actually, does this actually model what happens? And um, already with this, we can see that, you know, maybe before in the picture we had this decryption algorithm. So maybe it would be nice to give the adversary access to a decryption oracle. And this is exactly what was uh, done with CCA security. Um, so the adversary was given access to a decryption oracle to which they could query ciphertexts and try to distinguish whether uh, they were being interacting with an ideal or real encryption. And so you start to see a trend emerging that uh, we are interested in giving the adversary more and more power because the more the adversary can see, the more that we can be uh, confident that our uh, systems are secure. So us, the almighty uh, cryptographers, are building super strong, secure uh, crypto systems. So we want the adversary to have all the power in the world and uh, for us to claim that we still have security. But when we want to give this power to the adversary, um, how should we start to think about it? And one of the ways that we do this is by looking at the real world, actually, and seeing how our uh, encryption schemes work in practice and seeing what kind of uh, situations can arise there. And then we model those. So one such situation is the uh, key dependent message setting, where, for example, imagine you want to encrypt a hard drive. Often your key is stored on your hard drive. And if you want to encrypt the hard drive under that key, you're essentially uh, encrypting your key under a key and this sort of uh, secure, circular security issue here. Um, so this was modeled in the key dependent message setting. Um, and as you see, the picture has been slightly updated, but uh, from similar to before in the sense that we have a generation algorithm, which generates a key K star, um, which acts uh, as input to the encryption algorithm. But now we have this introduction of a function psi, which takes as input uh, the key K star and outputs a key dependent message M, which then is a uh, input to the encryption algorithm and is encrypted under the key and outputs the ciphertext and decryption remains the same. So how does this look from the adversary's point of view? It's similar to before in that we give them access to an encryption oracle, except now um, they will query psi's instead of a messages. And so this psi takes key k star and uh, generates a key drive message. And as before, they have access to a decryption oracle also. 
Um, so the need for KDM security was already hinted at in the original Golvasar Mekali paper, but first of year appeared more formally uh, in the Kamenech Lysanskaya paper in 2001, where they talked about anonymous credentials. And it was formalized in the random oracle model by Balare, Rodway and Shrimpton in 2003. Uh, it was shown feasible in the standard model in 2007. Um, there was KDM Secure Authenticated Encryption by Blare and Kiel VD in 2011. And from this paper, we take quite some inspiration for some stuff later on, I will show you. Um, there was generic block cipher construction in 2011 and in 2017, the ideal cipher and iterated Evermancer were shown to be KDM Secure. And so another uh, setting that is kind of similar, um, but instead of now, um, using a function to generate uh, key dependent messages. Here we use a function that generates related keys. And so this can arise, for instance, uh, naturally and by design, let's say in block ciphers by a key scheduling, or it can arise adversarially, let's say through something like fault injections. And so um, picture it remains similar to before in that uh, generation algorithm generates a key K star. Uh, but now this is acts as an input to this uh, function phi, which uh, outputs a related key, which is used as the input to encryption along with the message, outputs a ciphertext C. Um, here, similarly for decryption, um, it takes as input a related key K, uh, a ciphertext C, and outputs a message M. So how does this look from the adversary's perspective? Again, similar. Uh, we give the adversary access to an ENG oracle and uh, the adversary can query messages, but now the message is encrypted under related keys and similarly for decryption. And so uh, <coughs> related key security was kind of introduced uh, in the early 90s by Knudsen and Biam and formalized in 2003. In 2009, there were some high profile uh, related key attacks against AES, which must have been very exciting at the time. Um, in 2011, the idea was extended to capture idealized models. Um, in 2011, it was also given a comprehensive treatment. And in uh, 2015, there was a series of uh, works that proved RK security for Feistel and Evan Mansur. And so now a question, since we are so uh, interested in giving the adversary lots of power, is uh, can these attacks actually be confirmed? Bind. Can an adversary be clever and actually try to uh, mount these attacks at the same time? Um, uh, that's kind of the main question that we try to answer with this work. And uh, one of the first things we try to imagine is, you know, before in the KDM setting and the RK setting, we had fun uh, functions phi and psi that would generate key dependent messages and related keys. Is there a single function that we can do that would generate related keys and key dependent messages? And so first imagination of the picture would look something like this. Um, this is kind of our first uh, go at the key correlated setting where a generation algorithm outputs a key k star. Um, now we have a function xi uh, which takes as input the key k star and generates a correlated key and message pair. Um, so this uh, correlated key and message pair are then used as the inputs to encryption and it outputs the ciphertext as normal. And similarly, on the other side, we have a, a correlation derivation function xid, which uh, on input k star outputs a correlated key and ciphertext pair, which act as the inputs to decryption and it uh, outputs a message. So this seems like a nice uh, goal. And so in this work, uh, that's exactly what we do. We give a concrete treatment of uh, RK A plus KDM at the same time under the one heading for uh, symmetric primitives. And so uh, if you'll allow me a brief moment of interlude to talk about grammar, um, maybe over the years you have seen people say that, okay, look, uh, we have looked at CCA or K and KDM. As you saw on the previous slides, there were long lines of works on uh, each of these topics. Um, and so, you know, maybe we have it all covered, but to which I say no, actually, uh, you've looked at CCA, comma, RKA, comma, and KDM. And so uh, here we try to actually look at RK and KDM together. So if anyone ever complains to you about the uh, usefulness of grammar, you can say, well, uh, a well-placed comma can lead to separations in cryptography. 
But uh, anyway, this work is more than just me playing with commas. Um, as you saw before, there was a long line of works and, you know, KDM most notably arises in disk, disk encryption. Uh, our case, as I mentioned before, can arise either by design or due to attacks. So what about KCA? Can this actually arise uh, in practice or in real life? Does it make sense as a notion? And um, we think it does. And so we, you can start to imagine, let's say, if an adversary tampers with a key on a disk, then you are trying to really uh, encrypt related keys uh, on key dependent messages. So this can be a kind of a strange situation that is not covered by either um, uh, related key attacks or key dependent message attacks. And um, also there's a conceptual motivation in that it would be nice to give a unified approach. As I said, there was kind of a long line of work. So there were many ideas floating around about uh, all of these uh, topics. So in this work, we tried to give a kind of unified approach and just cover everything in one, one umbrella. Um, uh, so yes, we introduced this new model of security, which we call uh, key correlated attacks, and we try to show what happens in there. So how does this look from the adversary's perspective? Uh, similar to the RKA and KDM setting, um, in that the adversary has access to encryption and decryption oracles, except in this case now the adversary will query these XIs. And so um, for encryption uh, it takes a XI E, which takes a key K star. For decryption it takes a XI D, which takes a key K star. And so under the hood a little bit, this xi e, which takes the key k star, will output a key correlated key message pair. And for decryption, um, xi d will output a key correlated key uh, ciphertext pair. And so these uh, correlation derivation functions are derived from these correlation derivation sets um, as normal. And this has been done since um, the, the, all the previous work in KDM. So how might security look in this uh, setting? It's similar to CCA. Um, it's just a little bit uh, changed. As you can see, the challenger will generate a key K star from uh, Gen. It'll pick a bit B. The adversary then will choose a XI and it will uh, send this to the challenger. Um, this XI will be taken as input to a key correlated encryption oracle which, uh, depending on the bit B, will output a ciphertext C, which will be returned to the adversary. Under the hood a bit, how does this uh, key card, uh, KC Inc. Uh, oracle look? Well, it takes as input the um, XI E function, which takes as input the K star, uh, which it then outputs a key correlated key message pair. Uh, these key message pairs, so then this message is encrypted under this key, depending on the bit B, either in a real encryption or an ideal encryption, and the ciphertext is returned. Then uh, the adversary also has access to this uh, KC deck oracle, um, which it queries with XID. And so under the hood of this, it's similar as you can imagine. Um, XID takes as input the key K star, outputs a key in a ciphertext. Uh, the ciphertext will be decrypted under this key K, uh, depending on the bit B, either in uh, with a real decryption or an ideal encryption, and the message is returned to the adversary. The adversary can do many, many of these interactions and then eventually will output a bit B prime and will win if B prime equals B. So uh, a question then is, are all queries allowed? And the answer is, well, no, we can't do enc and then dec queries. Uh, we can't do dec then enc queries. Um, but this note is for the same key. And so um, when I say the same key, I mean these two queries, these two keys here. So now that we have a notion of a uh, key correlated uh, attack setting, and we kind of have a definition of what security might mean in that setting, um, it might be nice to ask, are there any actual box ciphers that achieve this uh, notion of security? And first place to look would be maybe at the ideal cipher itself. Um, and so the first kind of main result in the paper is that, uh, yes, the ideal cipher is uh, key correlated CCA secure if these uh, two correlation derivation functions satisfy some properties. So what about those properties? <clears throat> and the first one is key unpredictability, um, which simply says that the adversary can't guess the keys that are output by the size. 
And another one is Claw Freenus that says uh, the adversary can't find collisions between two different sides. And these notions are kind of well understood and well uh, accepted as they arise in the KDM and RKA setting. So it should be no different that they arise here also. But here uh, we need actually one more property to be achieved. And um, if you will come with me now, I'll try to explain a bit about what that is. Um, I'll try to in, uh, ask you via question. So imagine that we query XIE to KC Inc. Uh, one question is what might happen later when we query XID to uh, KC Deck. So just as a reminder, what happens with KC Inc. is that um, it takes as input XIE, XIE then takes the key, it generates a key and a message. The message is uh, encrypted under this key and it returns the ciphertext. Uh, with KC deck, uh, the uh, XID is taken as input. Uh, it generates a key correlated key and ciphertext pair. And the ciphertext is decrypted under this key and it returns a message. So um, some kind of strange stuff starts to happen here. I wonder if you can see already. So here we have a key and a cipher. So a key generated by the XI and it return, it, it uh, in turn generates a ciphertext. And here we have a key ciphertext pair. And so we need to make sure that at least these kind of clause that occur across algorithms can at least be detected so that we know when to perp and that the adversary is making uh, um, bad queries. And so because this kind of happens across algorithms with uh, these kind of different keys, we call this uh, XKCD, which is cross key claw detectability. And uh, we just need to be able to detect these claws across algorithms. We don't need to ensure that, uh, ensure claw freeness. And so how might this look if an adversary is trying to break it? Um, the adversary tries to guess a XI, e, a C, a XI, D, and an M such that, uh, you know, we have some detection algorithm that can try to detect these uh, cross key claws. And so how that works is that we have this uh, XI, e. So if we take the first component of XI, e on input K star, which will be a key K, together with the ciphertext that is uh, generated by the encryption alg algorithm run on the key generated by XIE. If this is the same as the key ciphertext uh, pair that are generated by XIED run on K star, and it's not detected, then uh, the adversary has broken the XKCD requirement. Um, or on the other hand, uh, this also works on the other cipher decryption. So if the first component of um, xi d on input k star so this will just be k and the message obtained by running decryption with the key uh, if this is equal to the key message pair output by xi e uh, if they are the same and the tech doesn't notice then the adversary wins and the bit is set to one so uh, overall uh, if xi e and xi d each satisfy key unpredictability and claw freeness as are required by kdm and rk and if the pair uh, xi e and xi d satisfy xkcd then the ideal cipher is kc cca secure so all good a uh, quick overview of the proof if we don't uh, look at deck for if we just look at encryption for a second um, via the KC Eng Oracle, uh, the adversary has access to an ideal encryption to which it uh, queries uh, XIE. Um, but because we're working in the ideal cipher model, the adversary also has access to um, a public ideal encryption and ideal decryption. And so um, if we want to ensure that key unpredictability, let's say, holds, um, we need to be sure to kind of keep consistency across these because the adversary can query this many, many times and it may end up uh, getting some key message pairs which are generated by here. So if the adversary does that, then it breaks the key unpredictability requirement. And so later on, the adversary also may uh, send a XI prime E, a different XI to uh, his ideal encryption. Um, and here we want to ensure that the claw freeness property holds. And so um, again, because they have access to a public uh, ideal encryption and ideal encryption, um, we say that if uh, some clause across uh, here, if, if uh, the adversary can um, 
find collisions across these, then we break the claw freeness property. And again, as I explained before, we need to keep consistency kind of across the i and and i deck uh, and uh, xi e and xi d. And if not, we will break the xkcd property. So, in case these uh, love hearts are too cutesy wootsy for you and you prefer some uh, more details on the proof, you can look in the paper uh, where we try to write things uh, in this game based uh, notation um, where we progress from the real setting to the ideal setting. And uh, I will just show you where the kind of bad events arise, but hopefully we try to write this uh, comprehensively, which may seem silly now as I put it all on this slide, but um, yeah, hopefully it's uh, clear. So um, now that we have shown uh, that the ideal cipher can achieve KCCCA security, actually maybe it's a good time to ask, do any such uh, XI e, XI D correlation derivation function sets actually exist? Because if not, we have quite wasted some time. Um, but luckily the answer is yes, because we just look at the XOR sets that work for the KDM and RKA setting and we show that um, they actually do satisfy the three properties that we need. So all is good. We have uh, something that is actually useful. So then the next question turns to what about actually concrete ciphers? Um, as you saw from the line of works before, uh, a lot of people actually looked at, or there were a few uh, works on the looking at the Evan Mansur cipher um, because it's nice to study. And uh, it was shown that um, two rounds were sufficient to achieve KDM security, and two rounds were sufficient to achieve RKA security. So the natural question is whether or not two rounds are sufficient for KCA security. And unfortunately, the answer turns out to be no. Um, there is an attack on two-round Evan Mansur in the KCA setting. So suppose we I'll give you a brief overview of the attack. Um, suppose we have a KDM encryption that looks like this. Um, and so we have uh, independent permutations and we have repeated keys. Uh, if we let some delta, some offset be defined as a permutation on the zero string, x or the permutation on the one string, and if we define a ciphertext to be uh, with the key component, uh, key XOR this delta, and the message component to be the key XOR delta XOR uh, the one string, um, what happens when we expand this? Uh, we see it looks like this, where we can then take the delta together with the uh, permutation on the one string and replace it with the permutation on the zero string. And then this whole thing now starts to look very much like what we had up here and lo and behold it is. And so we end up with an encryption of a key under the key offset by a known value, which is not very good because then we can just kind of decrypt and remove the known value and get the key in the clear. So this is quite um, bad. Uh, yeah, so um, two rounds are not enough. And the next question then is how many rounds are enough? And we show that actually uh, three rounds are necessary and sufficient. So that's cool. Um, it's not uh, too much worse. Um, and uh, yeah, so three rounds are necessary and sufficient um, with uh, uh, independent, permanent, uh, independent permutations and uh, repeated keys. So this is great. Now, uh, before I kind of go, there's one last result in the paper, which is where we decided to look at AE. So um, we really tried to cover all bases here. And instead of looking at AE alone, we look at AE AD because we're trying to stay up to date. And then we try to be secure by looking at it in the multi-user setting. And then we try to be more secure by looking at it in the misuse resistance setting. Um, I'll just show you briefly what happens here. The picture of uh, the view of the adversary looks similar to before in that they have access to the encryption and decryption oracles, except now they query uh, Xi E on K star. And here uh, under the hood, this Xi E actually now generates a key correlated key message nonce and header um, set. And uh, similarly for Xi D, it generates a key correlated uh, key nonce and header. So here we could have. Um, the, it was a design choice uh, to have the C on the outside and put, you know, it can happen that you can generate a key correlated ciphertext, but we somehow feel that we felt that it didn't really make that much sense. So anyway, are there any um, secure KC, CCA secure uh, AE schemes out there? 
um, well, we show a generic transform that does achieve this security. And this transform is very much, much based on the transform in the Ballara KLVD paper from 2011 that I mentioned earlier. And so all you do to achieve this is you just hash the key with the nonce and we show security for this. So if, um, if the Xi E and Xi D satisfy key unpredictability. And so that brings me to the end of the tour, which was quite, as I mentioned at the start, a whirlwind. So we give a new kind of um, setting um, for KCA attacks. Uh, in the paper, also I didn't mention now, but we show relations um, that KCA apply, uh, implies both uh, related key attacks and key dependent message attacks. And there are separations in the sense that uh, key, correlated, key correlated attacks are strictly stronger than the other two put together. Uh, we've shown feasibility in the ideal cipher model. We've shown um, that three rounds of uh, iterated Evan Mansour is needed to achieve KCA security. We give a generic transform that transforms a authenticated encryption scheme into a KCA secure authenticated encryption scheme and some other fun stuff along the way, which I will stop talking about now. So uh, I hope uh, that was fun for you. It was fun for me. Uh, if you want to know more details, uh, you can see them in the paper, which is on ePrint uh, and on the program for this conference. Um, it's under 2019 slash 1000. It's nice and easy to remember. If you want to ask us any questions, you will find all our details there. And yeah, so I hope you had a nice conference. I'm sorry that we couldn't be together. I'm sitting at home and it would be much, much nicer to be in Greece, but I hope uh, that we can see each other soon. Goodbye.